to stir these indignities, and you have bound me for accordingly. You tread upon my patience. But be sure, I will henceforth rather be myself. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it. And that same greatness, too, which our own hands have called to make so <laughs> My lord! Mister, get thee gone. For I do see danger and disobedience in thine eye. You could leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we shall send for you. You were about to speak? Yea, my lord. Those prisoners in your highness' name demanded, which Harry Percy here at home then took, whereas he said not with such strength denied. Either envy, therefore, or misprison is guilty of this fault, and not my son. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. But I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, came there a certain lord, neat, trimly dressed, his chin new reaped, fresh as a bridegroom. He was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a pouncet box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again. And as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves, unmannerly, to bring a slovenly, unhandsome corpse betwixt the wind and his nobility. He questioned me. Amongst the rest demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. Out of my grief and my impatience answered neglectingly, I know not what. I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your high majesty. The circumstance considered good, my lord. What a Lord Harry Percy then had said, may reasonably die and never rise, to do him wrong or any way impeach? What then he said, so he unsay it now? Why, yet he doth deny his prisoners, but with proviso and exception, that we, at our own charge, shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer, who, on my soul, if willfully betray the lives of those that he did lead to fight against that great magician, Dan Glendower, whose daughter, as we hear, the Earl of March hath lately married. Shall our coffers then be empty to redeem a traitor home? No. On the barren mountain, let him starve, for I shall never hold that man, my friend, whose tongue shall ask me one penny cost to ransom home. Revolted Mortimer! Revolted Mortimer! He never did fall off, my sovereign leech. In single opposition, he did confound the best part of an hour in changing heart of it with great Glendower. Three times they breathed. Three times did they drink upon agreement of swift severance blood. Never did base and rotten policy color her workings with such deadly wounds. Nor could the noble Mortimer receive so many, and all willingly. Then let not him be slandered with revolt. Dost belie him, Percy, thou dost belie him. He, he never did encounter with Glendower, I tell thee. He, he, he thirsts the smell of, well, met the, the devil alone. But, Sirrah, henceforth let not me hear you speak of Mortimer. And Lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners. Or you will hear of it. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them. Pause and stay a while. Here comes your uncle. Speak of Mortimer. Soon I will speak of him. And let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. Yea, on his part I'll empty all my faith and shed my dear blood drop by drop in the dust. But I will lift the downtrod Mortimer as high in the air as this unthankful bowling room. Brother, the king hath made your nephew mad. Who struck this heat up after I was gone? He will forsooth have all my prisoners. And when I urged again the ransom of my wife's brother, then his cheek looked pale, trembling even at the name of Mortimer. I cannot blame him. Was not he proclaimed by Richard Red in the next of blood? He was. It was when the unhappy king, whose wrongs in us God pardoned, he had set forth upon his Irish expedition. From whence he intercepted, did return to be deposed and shortly murdered. And for whose death we in the world's wide mouth live scandalized that thou hast spoken of. But soft, I pray, 
Did King Richard then proclaim my brother Edmund Mortimer heir to the crown? He did. Myself did hear it. Then, then I cannot blame his cousin king that wished him on the barren mountain starved. But shall it be that you, that set the crown upon the head of this forgetful man, and for his sake wear the detested blot of murderous sovereignation, shall it for shame be spoken in these days, or fill up chronicles in time to come, that men of your nobility and power did gauge them both in an unjust behalf, to put down Richard, that sweet, lovely rose, and plant this thorn, this canker, bowling pro No. Yet time serves wherein you may redeem your banished honors and restore yourselves to the good thoughts of the world again. Therefore, I say... Please, cousin, say no more. The emperor has a world of figures here, but not the form of what he should attend. Good cousin, give me audience for a while. I cry to mercy. Those same noble Scots that are your purpose... I'll keep them all. By God, he shall not have a Scot of them. You start away and lend no ear unto my purposes. Those prisoners you shall keep. Nay, I will. That's flat. He said he would not ransom Mortimer, forbade my tongue to speak a Mortimer. But I will bind him when he lies asleep, and in his ear I'll holler, Mortimer, nay, I'll have a starving, shall we try to speak nothing but Mortimer, and give him to keep his anger still in motion. Hear you, cousin, a word. All studies here I solemnly defy, save how to go and pinch this bowling brook, and his same sword and buckler, Prince of Wales, but that I think his father loves him not. Cousin, farewell. I'll talk to you when you're a better temper to attend. What a wasp, stung, impatient fool. Why, look you! I am whipped and scourged with rods, nettled and stung with pismires when I hear of this vile politician Bolingbroke. I want a candy deal of courtesy then did the fawning greyhound proffer me. Gentle, hairy Percy, kind cousin, all the devil take such covenants! God forgive me! Uncle, tell your tale, I am done. Nay, if you have not, to it again. We will say your leisure. I have done a faith. Then once more to your Scottish prisoners, deliver them up without their ransom straight, and make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland, which, for diverse reasons, which I will send you written, be assured will easily be granted. You, my lord, your son in Scotland being thus employed, shall secretly into the bosom creep of that same noble prelate, well beloved, the Archbishop. Of York is it not? True. Who bears hard his brother's death in Bristol, the Lord's proof, and only stays but to behold the face of that occasion that shall bring it on. I smell it. Upon my life it will do well. When the game is afoot, thou still let slip. Why, it cannot choose but be a noble plot. The powers of York and of Scotland to join with Mortimer, ha! And so they shall. In faith, it is exceedingly well aimed. And tis no little reason bids us speak to save our heads by the raising of a head. The king will always think of him in our debt. And see how ready how he does begin to make us strangers to his looks of love. He does? We'll be revenged on him. Cousin, farewell. No further go in this, and I, my letter, shall direct your court. When time is ripe, which will be suddenly, I'll steal the Glendower and Lord Mortimer, where you and Douglas and our powers at once, as I will fashion it, shall happily meet, to bear our fortunes in our own strong arms, which now will hold much uncertainty. Farewell, brother. We shall thrive, I trust. Uncle, I do. Oh, let the hours be short, till fields and blows and groans applaud our sport. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, like, comment, and subscribe, or hit the bell button below. And if you want to help us continue to bring you high quality theater, uh, please visit the website. And donate to our cause. Hope to see you at the next show. Bye! <laughs> Turum dirorum dirar virar.